This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with the percussionist and producer, Tony Sukar, and we talk about the leadership skills that Tony learned from soccer and how he applied that to his music career, what the role of the band leader actually is, and how he stays creative while traveling and touring on the road. Enjoy the episode. Hey, it's James Taylor, and today's show, I'm delighted to have Tony Sukar. He was born into a family of talented musicians in Lima before moving to Miami, Florida when he was just two years old. Growing up in a household imbued with the rhythm, it was no surprise at the tender age of 13, Tony began his own career as a musician, initially starting on piano before moving to percussion. Since then, he has worked with some of the greats of Latin music, including Arturo Sandoval, Nesta Torres, and Tito Puente Jr. You could say that Tony lives a creative and polyrhythmic life, being the president of his own entertainment company, as well as a band leader, percussionist, producer, composer, and arranger. His latest project, Unity, features more than 100 musicians and gives a Latin spin to the music of Michael Jackson. So, Tony, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, man. Great, great intro there. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, share with our listeners, what's going on in your world just now? Well, you know, um, I've been, uh, been working on, on, um, on the development of a project that, that we launched actually last year, um, titled Unity, the Latin Tribute to Michael Jackson. Um, it was an album, but uh, it quickly escalated and we did a you know, an entire uh, live concert PBS special that was uh, air prime time nationally. And uh, ever since then, we've been, you know, doing shows here and there with the project. And now we're getting ready to put together, you know, a brand new, basically um, upgraded version of the show for, for a nice tour that we're going to be doing. So very excited. Awesome. And so I mentioned you kind of started on piano and then you moved to percussion. So where on the percussion side, where did it kind of get started? And was there an early kind of mentor in your life and teacher? Yeah, well, um, I I always had percussion instruments in the house because I grew up in, in a family musician. So there was just percussion instruments lying around here. Um, and my dad is sort of, a, he, he's a piano player, but he you know, he always also like fiddled around with the percussion, and um, ever since I I started, um, like I, I saw the cajon, which is a Peruvian instrument. It's like a box, um, wooden box. I, I I don't know. I just started playing it, and um, I fell in love with the sound and uh, and the energy of, of being able to you know play percussion and, and this, and I just love the rhythmic aspect of everything. So um, I started learning on my own. You know, just going to my my um, parents' rehearsals, listening to the band, and then starting to listen to the percussionist play there, and I just, I really fell in love with the percussion, man. It was something that um, that really inspired me. And then, of course, after watching um, and listening to some of Tito Puente's work at the time, that was like the ultimate, you know, inspiration. And he's sort of been my, um, you know, my idol in a way and uh, role model that I hopefully one day, you know, can be like. It's funny, you mentioned the, the Cajon. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was working with uh, Luis Conte, the um, percussionist oh. with, uh, with James Taylor, the other James Taylor, and, um, and uh, oh, I mean, huge, a huge number of artists that, that Luis has worked with. And we were having this, co- this we were in uh, California to get, together, and we were having this conversation, and I said, oh, you know, I was, I was listening to uh, a flamenco a ba- uh, artist, and they had, they had someone playing the Cajon. I said, oh, it's, you know, it's a really cool instrument. And uh, I said, you know, and I, you know, I didn't realize this was a this was a, you know was a Spanish instrument. And he said, Oh no no no, it's not a Spanish instrument. <laughs> and then he said, you know, it's, it, and then he started talking to me about the about the history of of just that one instrument. And it was like getting a history lesson. Um, yeah. About, about the tra- about the migration of people. It was just really fascinating. I suppose you know, w- w- um, with percussionists, you are because it's not just one instrument. You're dealing with lots of different instruments all the time, usually, and so you kind of have to know not just the, you know, obviously the, the feels and and what that instrument can do and everything, but also kind of where what w- where its heart is as well, where it comes from. Yeah. No. Um. I mean, 
it's it's really interesting the the cajon and and I, I mean the history of every percussion instrument is really interesting because it comes from you know at, at one point or the other it had to have come from African descent so um, it, it comes from a place of like a lot of um, feeling you know it's um, and and that's sort of the I think one of the reasons why we we tend to you know percussionists love to understand the history of the instruments because we tend to um, be able to interpret the music better once we know where it comes from you know and and uh, and sort of its you know its its origins so I mean the cajon is very special to me and dear to me because it's it was you know it was made and basically created in Peru um, and slaves there in Peru and that's uh, I was born in Peru and I grew up listening to a lot of the Afro Peruvian music so that's why I was like really um, you know, inspired by that instrument, and it was the first instrument I I picked up in terms of percussion. And so, w- where did it kind of go from there? So you you started kind of you obviously obviously surrounded by music at home, and you were playing at home. When did it get to a stage where you you were saying, okay, this is this is kind of what I want to do with my life. I w- I want to be a professional percussionist and and, and musician. At what point did that happen? Actually, um, <clears throat> well. I, I, I did music as a hobby um, throughout my, you know, my years of in elementary, middle school, and high school. It wasn't really like a profession. I saw it as like, hey, you know, like this is cool. I mean, we were family parties, we play, and I did gigs with my parents' bands, and but I wasn't like, I didn't want to be like my parents. I didn't want to be like a gigging musician. I was like, oh, you know, this is kind of. I wanted to be able to go out on the weekends, and, you know, and. <laughs> And play soccer, and I was like, I was heavy into soccer and playing, playing a lot of that. <clears throat> but um, when I when I went to, the, um, you know, when I graduated high school, I had to choose a, a profession, you know, going into college, and uh, I actually started um, thinking about computer science and everything, and I tried it out, and it was like the boringest thing of life. So then that's when I was like, okay, you know what? Maybe it's time to see if music is pretty cool as a profession. And that I was like, you know, I, I, I entered this world of now this is like a real deal competition. You know, everybody high level musicians and, um, you know, everybody knew how to play their instruments very well. They were great readers. They could play jazz, they could play classical music, all these different styles of music that I wasn't really uh, exposed to. That's when I was like, oh my gosh, you know, and I'm a really competitive person. So I love the challenge. And um, it became like sort of a, addicting in a way you know I was like man I really want to get better in this and that and this and then uh, all of a sudden I was like a it was like a fever you know trying to get really really good and then uh, little by little I started you know I started uh, growing in, in terms of my musicianship and you know I, I decided hey you know what this is this is me you know this is this is what I, I was born for I, I got to do this for not only for a living but as my true passion and um and my life, you know, music is has got to be my life. So that's that's when it all happened. But you'd also obviously seen your 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 family as professional musicians as well. You know, it's a it's a tough job. It's a difficult jo- job, a different profession in terms of making a living, making a good living. Your your uh, your working kind of pretty unsocial hours uh, to a, a lot of time as well. So when when you decided, okay, I'm going to do this, did you have a feel that you kind of wanted to do it? maybe in a, a different way or you, you kind of <clears throat> w- wanted to come at it from a slightly different perspective than, than maybe your parents or your family or other people uh, around you had? Um, absolutely. I think, I, you know, I, I definitely wanted to do this differently because my parents, um, you know, they dedicate themselves more to um, playing shows and gigs like um, as an entertainment band. So they will do like a lot of covers and stuff like that. Um, which is cool, you know, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of gigs for that here in town, Miami, especially Miami. Um, but I didn't want to be in that life, you know, I wanted to do, um, I wanted to produce, make my own arrangements, um, and, and be a band leader, you know, I really wanted to have my own band because I didn't, I didn't like the fact that I, uh, had to depend on other people calling me to do shows and, and I didn't have full control of my own, um, you know, of, of my own destiny with, um, with my music, you know, I wanted the people to really feel my inspiration and what I'm about, um, musically speaking. So 
I chose that route and instead of being like the ordinary percussionist that you know plays with everyone and records with everyone and, and does this and that I wanted to you know be able to produce my own records write arrangements um, compose um, produce um, and then also be all around you know be an entrepreneur um, know the business inside out so I can do my own projects and and sort of that's that's what I've been dedicating myself to. I don't. I don't really see myself as a musician percussionist per se. I see myself more as a producer, uh, entrepreneur, sort of, sort of like, um, you know, Quincy Jones type of way. But you know, in the Latin world, mixed with you know, of course, like Tito Puente. You know, since he he plays the instrument that I love the most, and also he was able to accomplish a lot of the things that that I want to accomplish in my career. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned like Quincy um, Jones, obviously great trumpet player originally with Frank Sinatra and you know yeah. a, whole, a whole bunch of folks. Um, but th- that's a big jump taking that jump because it's it's I would imagine it's very easy just to be the hired hand to kind of sit back, less pressure, get the calls, go and do the shows, kind of straightforward. But when you're obviously the 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 band leader, you're you're putting everything, you're you're putting all the deals together as well there's a lot of stuff that you're having to do aside from the the th- stuff that you do when you actually get up onto the stage as well. So how did you, how did you adapt yourself to kind of getting your head in that place to be that type of person, that, that band leader, the person to have that kind of responsibility? Well, I, you know, it all has to do with um, being, being that type of person that likes the challenge, you know, and that is always trying to push the bar and, and having leadership, you know, I think leaders, you're born a leader, you know, I don't, I, I, I really think that you need to be, um, in that, in that, uh, in that frequency, you know, and be able to accept that you're going to have like a crazy lifestyle. You probably won't have time for anything ever. You're going to have to sacrifice a lot. Um, but I feel like the reward is much bigger because you're leaving much more of a legacy in a way, you know, um, and yeah, of course, that's the, I think that the, the minority of musicians want to do that because, like you said, the sacrifice and, and um, you know, there's a lot of easier routes um, to take. But, but again, like it's up to those few, few guys that really want to um, take that chance, you know, because it is a big chance, you know, I and mean, you're, you're risking a lot. Um, but I, I did it because I, you know, again, I'm, I'm a very challenging person. Um, I come from a background of, uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, soccer. I think that helped me a lot too, because it, it taught me a lot of discipline, you know, and, and being able to, um, understand the, the sacrifice behind, uh, the sport. And, and, and I was also a captain, so I had that vibe of like you know, I really wanted to be a leader and stuff so I think all this combined together is what you know made me decide hey you know what like, I, I need to take this route like, I have the inspiration for it you know I have the talent for it I feel like I have great ideas um, and although I don't have the money or the infrastructure or anything else I think um, my ideas talent plus work ethic is enough to make way for my own career you know and if this this uh, this leadership is is a big strength that you have as a creative person, what would you say is your your biggest weakness? Um, I think my biggest weakness um, would probably be um, the doubts I have in my mind. You know, a lot of times I'm indecisive with things because um, I want to do so many different things. You know, so I don't. I have so many ideas that um, sometimes it's hard just to choose one and say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm going to put everything to a side because I'm doing this and I want to do it perfect, you know? Yeah. Um, so so that's that. But um, that that's why I decided to do this whole Unity project that I did was because I, I needed to decide on something and I felt really strong about that idea. You know, I felt really strong and... And although I was against all the odds and I had no contacts in the industry and it was probably like, I mean, everybody told me it was going to be impossible and I was crazy and it wasn't going to work and this and that, I finally decided something for myself and said, you know what, I don't really care about what anybody says. You know, I, I got to go with my inspiration, got to go with my gut and I'm going to go full 150,000% on this. <laughs> and that's what I did for, for five years of my life and 
I luckily I did that because it it it, it made my career literally that this project made my career it wasn't my past uh, opportunities playing with other artists because I mean mind you, I, I have a bunch of friends that are great musicians that are you know have been playing with like Gloria Stefan for twenty something years you know and and yeah but they never made any room for themselves you know and it's like I felt like if I was gonna stay in that little world it was gonna be the same thing so um, it wasn't really my you know, somebody that gave me a hand or anything like that. It was literally just, hey, you know what? You know, pure work ethic and and believing in yourself, you know? So, you, so you're now at a point where maybe in the past, opportunities were fewer and far between. So you had to really, you were constantly pushing, pushing, pushing the whole time to, to make things happen, to get build that momentum. But now you're maybe at a point where those opportunities, you're getting lots of opportunities are coming at you from all different angles. So how do you decide which ones are worth pursuing now when you, you have a limited amount of time and it's a really important, important point in your career where you can, what to do next? Yeah, uh, that's where the, where the weakness comes in, you know, where it's like, like um, now that there's a lot of options, there's a lot of context, there's, <laughs> there's so, much, so much to do. Um, now I know how to do it a lot quicker, but you're facing now... Um, the issue with um, the business side of things, you know, where it's like, okay, we want to do this project, you know, and you have a, a Universal, you have a Sony, you have one of these big monster record labels that want to come in and partner. But then it's like, okay, but you know what? We need to do this so it could sell better. Or we need to involve this person because it's just going to attract more people to it you know mm. while when I first started my project it had nothing to do I had not one thought of being commercial I didn't have one thought of like oh I want to sell more records it was more like man I just want to make this as musical as possible like just make it amazing you know mm. so that's why um, I decided to do it you know and so now I'm, I'm facing that challenge can you talk about a time when Obviously, with the, the Unity project, it's been a great, you know, great success. But have there been other projects in the past where you've also kind of given it your all? You've given you know, all your love and heart to getting this project to happen, to some project to happen, and it just didn't work out. And then what were the lessons that you took, had to take away from that experience? Um, well, yeah, that's, that's definitely happened. Uh, I mean, everything is trial and error, you know. Um, um, I, I did, I was trying to do an original music, like salsa project, um, like salsa music just to, for my local band, but I don't see it as a fail. You know, I see it more as a, as a preparation. It's all like, it, it was all taking baby steps, you know, to prepare myself to be able to do, do what I did. Um, and I learned a lot, you know, it was more learning on the technical side of things, learning also about musicians, how they record and what musicians to call for what styles of music. Um, it, it opened up doors for me to do local gigs with my band. Um, but again, it, you know, it was, um, it, it, I didn't, I didn't, I put the same amount of I, I, dedication and passion to it, but I don't want to say that the same amount of work ethic, you know, mm. um, the work ethic that, that was required for the unity project was sickening. You know, it was, like, <laughs> it, was it was truly sickening. It was like, my gosh, like this guy's going to die anytime soon. Like that's what people would tell me. Like, Cause this is I a mean, big, this is a big band. I mean, how, how many, I just saw some of the, some of the video stuff and uh, yeah, what, size of band, what size of band is this? We're talking, it's like, well, 10 pieces yeah, the, no the smallest size band that we have with the unity project 16 wow. that's like the smallest version so i mean in the pbs special that we did we had a 37 piece band you know and um i mean all types of instruments you know you have all the all the latin percussion stuff you have the rhythm section like you know bass you have two i mean keyboard player uh, piano player guitar and you have harp you know um you have the choir you have the strings you have uh, the background singers, you have the five horns. It's it's a lot of a lot of elements, you know. And um, and but the tough part is is also not only getting everybody together, but then getting everybody to be on that mindset of I got to play my own role, you know, and and treat it as if it's a almost as if it's a symphonic orchestra, you know, but playing salsa music mm. with Michael Jackson influence. So you have a lot of the pop element too. It's um, it's a lot of arranging, uh, a lot of um, organization, and keep in mind that this whole thing has been independently managed. Um, 
So, so, how, so how do you, you know, in terms of leadership style for something like this, obviously there's there's lots of the history of, of music. You've got guys like Buddy Rich um, who were, were, they had a certain type of leadership style when it came to dealing with musicians and they were pretty dictatorial. And then you have obviously other people like the Duke Ellingtons and, and, and other people who had a, di- a different kind of style. So what's what's your vibe when you are you come into that, that you know, coming to that sound check um, or you've, 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 you've run through the, the, the sound check and then you're backstage, you're about to come on. What is, what's the kind of the, the, pre, the pre-game talk, the pep talk that you give, give to the team? Well, um, luckily, um, I work a lot. I work with my friends, you know. Um, these guys that are in my band and that perform with me are my, my dear friends um, that have been together with me for years. So it's more of a friendship thing, you know. I mean, we all know that we can kid around and stuff like that. But when we go into the stage, it's business, you know. We got to all execute um, at a very high level, professional level. So... Um, I don't, I'm not a dictator type of person, but I, they know that I don't mess around. So like, you know, everybody's there on time and, and they respect that. And if they, for example, make an error or do something, I'll, I'll let them know. Um, and I've had to cut people before, even though they're my friends, you know, um, and, but, but others realize that and they're all like, yeah, Tony's, you know, no joke or whatever, but that's the way it's got to be. You know, it's, you've got to draw a line of discipline. Um, in order to get things done at the level because again people um, the audience um, you know they're 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 buying tickets they're buying records to go see to have an experience uh, at a high level and I want to be able to bring that to them at the highest level possible you know I'm not there just hey you know I'm gonna go jam you know this is this is something that takes a lot of preparation and work and and I want to give the best to them so, um, and so this next stage, you're about to go on like more shows on the road, bigger tours, um, you know, bigger, I imagine kind of bigger production as well. H- how do you ensure that as you're doing this, you're also staying creative and, 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 and keeping the kind of keeping your, your, your mind kind of going so you're not just doing the doing that um, kind of sh- same kind of show type thing every day or every night that uh, you're actually um, do you kind of when you're on the road are you writing all the time when you're on the road as well do you wait until you have a break go back to Miami do some more writing and recording and then go back on the road again it's tough to balance all these things out at once um, and um, that's that's the other challenge that I'm working on right now I'm trying to build a team so that because right now I'm, I'm involved in everything you know um, in terms of the unity project um, uh, I mean, a lot of the videos that you're watching now, I edited them. So I do all the video editing. I do a lot of the media stuff. Um, 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 I, I don't have a big team, you know, so I'm trying to, um, you know, on the production stuff even too, like creating writers and, and, t- and do sending stage plus and all that stuff. So I'm, I'm building a team uh, crew that I, that I can trust that, that will keep that level of detail in my shows so that I can have more time to be able to, to write and, and continue in the studio. Right now, I'm, I'm working on several projects um, that I want to do uh, for this upcoming year, uh, 2017. So I'm in the pre-production stage, uh, and I want to go full force with it. You know, so that's where my my head is at right now. Um, meanwhile, not lose the concentration on the live show. So it's about building a team, you know, and being able to delegate, and that's sort of a challenge that I'm facing with right now. Um, in order to be able to continue, um, you know, the, the life in the studio, which is what I love too, you know. And what's the best advice that you've ever received about making a, making a life and a career in music? Best advice I've ever received, I think, is um, uh, how it has to be, like, you know, just the, the work ethic, you know. It's, um, it really isn't about the talent in a way, you know. It's, uh, somebody told me that... Um, it more important, way more important is is the work ethic and and how bad you want it. You know, um, talent is something that many people will have, but what's going to separate you from the rest is your is your work ethic. You know, um, if you're putting more hours into your craft and disciplined hours, it's not about putting in just more hours fiddling around with your instrument. You know, it's it's about knowing where where to put it in and and like I said, like the discipline behind it. Um, 
uh, the wisdom, you know, you have to have wisdom too. So it's, it's literally that, you know, I think, um, that's been the key to my success. At least it's, it hasn't been luck or it hasn't been money, um, or hasn't been some sort of, uh, you know, investor or something <laughs> like that. No, it's been just pure work ethic, man, like crazy work ethic and seeing and just being wise about things. And, uh, whenever a door is shut, man, just keep going forward. And, and, um, there's just, there's just endless opportunities out there. You just can never give up. And you mentioned you were you're really into kind of soccer when you were kind of going through school and college. Is there a, is there a personal habit that you think contributes to your success? Uh, well, I mean, I I think um, the the whole the whole habit of of caring about your health too. You know what I mean? Like caring about like the way you you feel. Um, and eating right and not drinking, you know, and just because you need to be able to like function at the 150,000%, you know, when you're on the field, like I, I just, I live that same lifestyle on stage, you know? Um, so I care about that stuff. And I think that, um, that discipline just keeps me on track. You know, I'm not like after gigs, you know, I don't go out drinking to the bars, you know, that's like, that's no, it's, it's about, it's about business, you know, mm-hmm. getting things done. And, and I have fun with it. You know, I love it. I love it so much that I don't need these other things, you know? Yeah. So that's definitely one of the things I think is, a, is, a, is going to stay for me forever. And then you mentioned you doing everything, including editing the videos. And, you know, you're getting into that, that, that level of depth into what, into what you're doing and, and that kind of hands-on. Do, do you have an, any kind of online resources or tools like uh, Evernote or, or Pro Tools that you absolutely love? Yeah, for sure. I use Evernote all the time, actually. I also use Wonderlist. I'm like a – I mean, um, if Google Drive ever goes down, I think my whole entire <laughs> life would just – it'll die, you know? Uh, I mean, I use – uh, all the tools that possibly, I mean, technology is a big thing. That's one of the things that, that's why I, I wanted to do computer science in a way, because I thought that this was going to be, you know, what I love. And it's not that I love it. It's just that I love to be on top of technology to make my life simpler, you know? So, I mean, I have like 12 iPads, you know, um, I, you know, I've written over 160 charts. So, you know, I have them all loaded in the iPads with four score and I sync all the iPads. So when I change a tune, it changes for everyone on the iPad. So I have a router, you know, just all these things that, that you can use. I mean, I, of course, I use Pro Tools um, and I use Adobe Premiere for editing videos. And um, um, you just you have to be able to go parallel with technology because it's the only way that you will be maximum uh, efficient, you know, with your time. And, and with where, with where things are going, you know, you got to be on top of things. This is why social media is so important too, you know, and that's why I'm always editing videos, posting them online and and communicating with my fans is because, uh, that's extremely important. You know, people, people feel that. Yeah. I noticed you, you, you're really into uh, getting to Facebook live now as well. Yeah. I'm I'm super into it. And actually I'm, I'm working on something right now with, this company called IK Multimedia, which is like an awesome company that sent, that sells all these uh, cool products for for your tablets and your phones, uh, pro audio gear, you know. So I can now, I want to be able to do like a live stream at a show, but not only a live stream, you know, a, a Facebook live stream where I have my phone and the audio is going through the phone. No, I'm going to have like, you know, a separate entire mix coming out of the board, like a separate matrix with my engineer mixing it live so that it goes into the interface through the phone and so that you can be watching it, but you can be listening to like a great mix, yeah. you know, of what's going on live. So that's what I want to be doing now. And, um, and that's something I just discovered through, through IK and I got in contact with them and then they're going to, you know, give me an endorsement with the products, you know, so it's all about those type of ideas, you know, I just, and it's, it's amazing. I mean, you've got the, obviously virtual reality now is going to start kind of taking off in a bigger way where, and I can imagine uh, with some of those things where if you're if you're living in Beijing and, and you want to kind of check out, you know, your, your one of your shows is going to be, a, you know, you, you don't have to just kind of sit and watch it in a very two dimensional thing. You can it can almost have it that you're actually in in the space watching it. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, 360 videos are becoming way, way more popular. I'm, I'm going to buy my first 360 camera um, in a couple of months once it comes out. Um, 
and I want to be, you know, I, I want to be on top of that. You know, I want to be able to stream that, you know, and at least edit it so that people can, you know, be sort of in the band, you know, like, yeah, if yeah. you're just like standing within the band and, you know, turn around and see the bass player and look forward and look at the dancers and then look to the side and you have the conga player right next to you. You know, it's like really cool things, you know, that, that I think, um, and, I, and actually guys play. like what a company I, I've been involved in, um, called Spectrum Interactive, work called uh, Tutti Dynamics, and they did uh, actually some of that stuff with Wynton Marsalis uh, recently, where um, they, they basically put 40 cameras uh, in the room. Uh, so you could actually say, I just want to watch the left hand of the guitar player <laughs> with the score running underneath as well, and you oh can absolutely gosh. do that. And now with obviously 3D, uh, now they're going to have it where you, you don't need to have 40 cameras, you can have four cameras, and it's going to be picking up every single thing that's kind of going on in that space as well, and have the music running, wow. and then say, I just want to pull out the the drummer or the bass player, and I want to put myself into that mix as well. It's it's a it's a really fascinating time uh, that that we're kind of uh, in the middle of just now in the music industry. Wow, that's crazy. And I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll put a bunch of these links as well. And what you're talking about the three D, the three hundred and sixty degree cameras, is the one that you've got. You, it sounds like you've got your eye on on one just now. Yeah, Nikon is going to come out with one that's pretty insane, man. Um, it's it's really really neat, and uh, you know it's four K, um, and it's sort of like you know uh, I don't know if you watch those um, videos on Facebook where. They have 360 abil- um, ability, and you just like you know you, you get your mouse and you just swipe to the right, and you're just turning around. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that, that's exactly what you can do with this Nikon. Um, I like it a lot because it's also the the frame rates uh, of the camera, um, the the resolution of it, everything is awesome. You know. I think Jake, Jacob, so. a friend of mine, Jacob Collier, who's a big kind of YouTube star musician, he's been uh, experimenting it just now with his Patreon campaigns where people pledge to have him do more 360 videos as well so it's uh it's really really cool so while we're talking about gadgets and things so if you could recommend just one record and one book to our listeners what would they be um well one record um to recommend man that's kind of really difficult uh <laughs> Dude, that's like one of the hardest questions I've ever had in my life. <laughs> um, is is there one that you've told, one that you've gifted, or you've? I mean, obviously with with Spotify now, we don't do so much gift things. But is is the one that you've you've said to more people than anything else? You've got to listen to this. You've got to check this out. Well, it's just it's different because I mean, some some people are musicians, some people are not. I mean, if I would if I would have to recommend one album within my world, you know, within the Latin world, that really you know, sticks out. Um, it's actually not even a famous record. Um, not a lot of people know about it. Every time I recommend it, nobody knows about it, actually. <laughs> but it's an awesome record, and I really like it a lot. It's, it's from this piano player called Tony Perez. He's one of my favorite piano players um, in, in Cuba. Uh, he actually lives here in Florida now. But it's called um, From Enchantment to Timba, to Full Force Timba, or something like that. Um, it's, it's a Latin jazz record. Um, and it's it's really really incredible, man. I mean, it's the the level of musicianship is is amazing, um, and that's I think one of the records that I've listened to the most over the past uh, couple years. You know, but things you know things change also over time. And this was this is a record that released like in two thousand one, man. It's like a, you know it's pretty old, but you know some of the best stuff is like that, you know. <laughs> And, and what would the, um, what would the book be? What's the book that you have that you would you would either gift to someone or has really inspired you personally? Uh, I would have to say, um, you know, I, I don't read a lot um, because I just never really have the time to read. But there's a book that somebody gave to me that was really amazing. Um, it's called uh, I Steve, and it's by Steve. Um, it's it's uh, Steve Jobs, basically, uh, in his own words. You know, yeah. Um, I think uh, it's just this guy was insane, man. You know, <laughs> Steve Jobs is incredible, bro. I mean, damn, like those type of guys. You know, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, you know, Walt Disney, anything that has to do with those guys. I mean, read their stories, you know, and and it's just incredible, man. You know, and it's really inspiring. It really pushes you to the limit. You know, it it, it makes you understand that anything is really possible with we're just having great ideas and insane work ethic and um, and passion, you know. 
So, so I love Steve Jobs. It's great. Graham, we'll put, if people go to jamestaylor.me and just type in Tony Sukar, you'll be able to find the links to all these show notes that we were just talking about as well. So the final question for you, Tony. Let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So you have the tools of your trade, you, you have your instruments and the knowledge that you've acquired over the years, but no one knows who you are and you have no contacts in, in the business. How would you restart things? Um, well, I, I, I don't think I would do anything differently, but just to have my eyes more open um, in terms of like, uh, scammers, you know, because in this business there's like scammers everywhere, you know, it's like ridiculously um, insane how many people are out there that just take, you know, money from you. Um, so I would try to avoid those um, those people, you know, and, and not be so gullible at times. However, in terms of actually getting a project done and doing like the music element or the, the, the creative part, I wouldn't do it from any other different type of place because like I said um, earlier in this interview, um, one of the keys to the success of my project was um, uh, the music, you know, and it coming from such a pure place of like wanting to just do something of maximum taste and quality. Um, it wasn't necessarily um, inspired by or um, the focus was never to be commercial, you know, or to sell records or to 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 make it more popular you know it was just yeah. all about the music and that's what opened the doors for me that's what attracted everybody into this project um and has been the you know the key to success for me so i would just do it exactly the same you know same exact um procedure well tony thank you so much for coming on the show what is the best way that people can connect with you and learn more about your music and and the live shows you got coming up well, yeah, everything is on my website, TonySukar.com. Um, but, you know, if you follow me through Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, um, you can be literally day-to-day -day with me, you know, because I'm every, every single day posting something and, and just very active on, on what the new uh, things are happening, you know. So just keep up to date with me there, and, and, um, and we'll, be, we'll be chatting soon. Great. Well, Tony, thanks for coming on the show. I wish you all the best with the, the touring. I'll let you get back into the studio now and all the best with the Unity Project and whatever comes next. Thank you so much, man. Take care. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.